Yeah. All right, welcome everyone. Why don't we get started? I think there'll be lots to talk about, so I want us to have as much time as, uh, as possible. Uh, many of you know me, but for those of you who don't, my name is Ben Valentino. I'm a professor uh, in the government department here at Dartmouth where I teach uh, international relations. If you're here, you know the, the purpose of this panel is to have a discussion, I think, I hope, a wide-ranging discussion about America's long relationship um, with Iraq. Uh, Iraq, I think it's fair to say, has been at the center of American foreign policy uh, for at least 20 years, uh, longer than that uh, probably as well. Uh, essentially, over those last 20 years, the United States has been in a, in a more or less constant state uh, of war. Again, some of you probably aren't even aware how, how frequent the ongoing military operations were against Iraq between the, the two Gulf Wars, between 1991 and, and 2003. But the idea that there was ever really a state of peace there in that interwar period between the United States and, and Iraq is, uh, is a bit of an illusion. In those 20 years of, uh, of conflict, and our relationship with Iraq uh, goes back obviously even before that, um, but just in those 20 years, uh, the conflict has cost thousands of American lives, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives, and uh, literally trillions of dollars, probably at least uh, $3 trillion when the, all the accounting is, is done at the end of the day. And, and this sort of fatal attraction uh, that we have with that country is not over. Our relationship with Iraq is not at an end, uh, although um, uh, some people wish that it were. Um, American uh, warplanes are probably at this moment flying over Iraq, or at least uh, American drones, as we uh, prepare for and conduct uh, airstrikes against ISIS, uh, the offshoot of al-Qaeda in Iraq, which began there um, during the American War. So, um, so our purpose here is to have a discussion about, uh, about those 20 years and about the, the future as well. And we're lucky to have with us uh, three people who have all thought very deeply about America's uh, relationship uh, with Iraq and can help us understand that relationship. And, and they've all approached that relationship in, in very different ways. So I think we're lucky to have all three of them together it will give us a, a more nuanced picture. Let me introduce uh, first Phil Cly, who's a graduate of uh, Dartmouth College, graduated in, uh, in 2005 and is a veteran of the US Marine Corps. He joined the Marines after uh, graduating and served as a public affairs officer in Ambar province uh, in Iraq uh, from 2007 uh, to 2008 during the surge. Anbar, as many of you know, was the most violent um, uh, uh, province uh, of Iraq and where uh, much of America's struggle uh, during that period uh, took place. Uh, Phil is the author of this uh, truly excellent book, which I recommend to all of you, a book of uh, fiction, short stories about Iraq called Redeployment. Um, the, uh, if you Google it, you will see I won't read to you the many glowing uh, and well-deserved reviews that it's um, received, uh, but Google it and you'll find out. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, or you could take the word uh, for it of the National Book Award Committee, which has nominated it for the shortlist uh, for the National Book Award, which is a really amazing achievement for a first book. Very few uh, first books uh, uh, make it that far. And we will all be thinking about him on November 19th, uh, which is when they will make their, uh, their final selection. Phil does have uh, one accomplishment, which at least personally I put above all those others, and that is that he uh, managed to convince Jessica Alvarez, who was my former student, uh, uh, honor student of mine, to marry him. That's how I know Phil. Uh, and so, although he's done many great things with his life, I think that was, at least for me, um, the, the best of all. I'm with you. <laughs> uh, uh, next, we have Steve Simon, who's sitting there at the end of the table. Um, uh, Steve is currently a visiting scholar here at Dartmouth at the Dickey Center. We're quite lucky to have him. He's had a very distinguished career studying uh, terrorism and the Middle East uh, more generally. He's been, uh, he has way too many uh, uh, jobs for me to list, uh, or has had too many jobs for me to list all of them. Let me give you a sense just uh, so you know to take what he says seriously. Uh, he was a senior director uh, for Middle Eastern and North African Affairs at the White House from 2011 through 2012. He earlier served on the National Security Council as Director for Global Issues and Senior Director for Transnational, Affair, Transnational Threats. He's been a Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's worked at RAND. He's been a professor at uh, Georgetown in the Security Studies program there. Uh, 
and he's the author of numerous uh, and important, well-received uh, publications, uh, mostly on terrorism, including uh, two of the most important, uh, The Next Attack and The Age of Sacred Terror, which many of you will know he wrote, uh, co-authored with Daniel Benjamin, uh, who's the director of the Dickey Center here at Dartmouth. And then last but not least, my colleague, uh, Bill Woolforth, who will be known to many of you already. He's the Daniel Webster Professor uh, of Government, uh, just uh, next door down the hall from me. Uh, and he also, author of many uh, influential books on international relations and American foreign policy, most notably uh, and recently, a book called World Out of Balance, with he, which he wrote with uh, another colleague of mine, Steve Brooks, uh, who's uh, here with us now, and I think some of you are taking class from uh, Professor Brooks. Uh, and he's at work on a new book with Professor Brooks and another uh, uh, professor uh, on American foreign policy. So he's thought deeply on the big issues of American foreign policy. So that's our, our panel. Let me uh, describe the format uh, for you because I think it'll be a little different uh, than, uh, than uh, some similar panels. The first 30 minutes or so of this uh, discussion uh, will be um, uh, a, a discussion amongst the panelists. I'll pose some questions that I've uh, thought up in advance uh, for the panelists. And then uh, that will just, I hope, set the groundwork for the conversation, give us something uh, to chew on. And then after that 30 minutes, we'll open it up to all of you uh, to ask questions of the, the panelists. So that's how we're going to proceed, if, if you'll permit us. So I'll have a seat in a second, but let me start. Um, and uh, all these questions, any of you should feel free to answer, but um, I may uh, at some times encourage some of you to answer some of the questions uh, more than others. And so the first question I think is really uh, for Bill and Steve to think about, and, and that's, let's start this discussion, although I said we've had this 20-year relationship with Iraq. Let's start uh, in 2003 um, with one of the, I think, enduring questions or debates about the war, and that is, what were America's reasons uh, for the 2003 war? There's been uh, many different um, uh, alleged motives, including the, the ones that were most clearly stated publicly at the outset of the war, um, the motives regarding WMD uh, and terrorism. But critics have alleged many other reasons uh, for our intervention there, ranging um, from oil interests to democratization, to even uh, Bush's desire to seek revenge for an assassination attempt on his father that was carried out uh, by Iraqi forces uh, at, right after Bush uh, left office. Uh, so there were lots of uh, reasons why people have uh, thought we've had this uh, 2003 war, which we're still dealing with the after effects of. And I'm curious for, uh, to get your opinion just to start us off. What brought us into this latest uh, war with Iraq uh, in 2003, or more broadly, if you want, what explains this the longer fatal attraction, as I called it earlier, between the United States uh, and Iraq? So, Stephen, Bill, do you want to start us off? Who wants to start? <laughs> okay. Go for it. Um, it was a mistake. <laughs> um, uh, I, look, I think um, uh, you know Ben uh, listed probably all the major factors, at least that I'm aware of. Um, I think the, the submerged uh, uh, factor that hasn't been talked about, I think, all that much, uh, in terms of the attraction that Iraq held um, uh, for the uh, Bush administration, but I think for others as well, um, was it, Iraq was seen as, in a sense, the ideal Middle Eastern ally, potentially. Uh, there was a great deal of unhappiness, um, uh, tears, and flapdoodle over the relationship with Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, an obscurantist uh, regime uh, that, uh, at the sort of at the end of the day, gave birth to, uh, literally and figuratively, to uh, Bin Laden. Um, uh, was, and, and Saudi Arabia was a problematic ally in uh, a number of respects. Uh, the other uh, major ally of the United States uh, in the region, Israel, had its own um, uh, uh, disadvantages uh, as a regional ally uh, for, uh, for the United States. Uh, then you look at Iraq, I mean from a particular perspective, and you see a secular country, 
endowed with enormous oil deposits, um, techno technocratically oriented, a big modern army, a scientific establishment capable of producing, or very, very nearly uh, producing nuclear weapons, um, uh, you know, just before the uh, Americans invaded, a uh, very sophisticated enrichment program. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're the, an American looking for an ally uh, in the region, a platform for U.S. power projection, uh, that didn't have uh, the disadvantages of either um, uh, its traditional conservative um, uh, Gulf allies, the monarchies on the one hand, and Israel on the other, Iraq looked pretty darn good. And if you were able to convince yourself that uh, an invasion of Iraq that toppled um, uh, its... Uh, its wicked leader, uh, Saddam uh, Hussein, uh, in a surgical operation, um, uh, and to the um, immense gratitude, presumably, of the Iraqi people, well then, um, uh, you'd really done yourself a big favor. That's, that's what you call a foreign policy coup. So I think there was a bit of that sort of seductive um, uh, uh, thinking at work uh, in, uh, in, in terms of the decision to invade. The decision to invade was made quite early on, though, and this is the only thing I'll add because, uh, you know, like you, I'm interested in what others on the panel have to say about this. Um, you know, 9-11 was a deranging uh, event uh, in a lot of ways, and one um, product of that, you know, derangement uh, was the decision to uh, invade because uh, the uh, administration at the time believed quite strongly and continued to believe actually for quite a while uh, that uh, the Iraqi government was linked, the, the Saddam regime was linked to the attack um, uh, on the United States on 9-11. Uh, and combined with uh, the belief that uh, Iraq uh, possessed weapons of mass destruction, a belief that, you know, was underscored uh, by intelligence community analysis that was largely inferential in nature, but, you know, sort of hard to argue with, um, uh, suggested that invasion, the invasion of Iraq was an urgent um, defensive uh, requirement on the part of the United States. I'll add to that only a little bit of context. Uh, so Steve mentioned both the defensive and the offensive or upside potential motivations. And there's a, they all seem to come together in the White House and then catalyzed by 9-11, create an environment that made this decision very, very uh, overwhelmingly popular uh, within this po policy community. There's indeed a very well-researched book, we can debate about it, uh, that argues that that invasion was happening regardless of who was president of the United States, that a, that a Gore administration would have, would have gone forward with it. Let me just give you a little sense of the context, whether you buy that argument or not. Let me give you a little bit of sense of the context to add to what Steve said. The first context is that the mood in, 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 in 2002 was the result of a series of what were perceived to be extremely successful American uses of force in the world. We had the original Gulf War, the first time, uh, the very short, very low casualty, and strikingly successful use of American military power. That had followed an Air Force-only attempt to reverse Serbian policy in Kosovo. We won't go into the details, but by and large, from 15,000 feet, the United States caused Syria, Serbia to give up on its claim to be able to be the sovereign in Kosovo. That followed the Balkan interventions of the mid-1990s, which although were not as clean win columns for the United States as some of the others, nonetheless seem to show application of U.S. power generating a favorable outcome. The mood in Washington was that this policy tool was very, very successful. Not only that, if you look back on those earlier uses of power, you'll note there's one thing they don't have in them, which is they don't have counterinsurgency. They're all applications of American coercive force that don't have to deal with irregular counterinsurgencies. 
So right before this event, the, uh, the immediate preceding event was the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan in the wake of 2001 uh, terror attack, which was a very low footprint attack, which quickly and successfully toppled the top of Taliban regime. And as far as anybody knew in 2002, that was another exceedingly successful use of American power. So that mood that U.S. military is awesome and that it's a really useful tool to solve policy problems was powerfully in evidence throughout the American policy community before this event. And of course, we all now know that mood has changed. The second contextual factor is that the previous policy of the United States regarding Iraq had been widely seen within the policy community as an abject failure. That is to say, we had a long series of very, that Ben Valentino pointed out, of sort of coercive attempts, sanctions attempts, to get Iraq to expose, open up the coffers, open up the closets, and let us uh, intrusively inspect its uh, alleged uh, weapons of mass destruction programs. Those sanctions led to one of the worst humanitarian crises of the 1990, with massive uh, death among uh, innocent Iraqi civilians. The sanctions regime was seen as a catastrophe, a total failure. The containment regime wasn't working. The coalition around Iraq wasn't holding together. The policy community didn't see a lot of other options for dealing with Iraq. The option they were presented in 2002 was contain it, continue to contain it, and hope everything goes all right, or deal with it in a decisive manner. So there was this, this, this combination of heady power and a sense of a failed policy that helped contribute to this. But then on top of that, there was this more, shall we say, visionary idea that you could transform Iraq, indeed, perhaps even the Middle East, by toppling this regime and creating in that, in its stead, a, a pro-American, uh, reliable ally and a democracy. Uh, the government, as far as we know from post hoc accounts of what happened, basically all of these strains, the, both the defensive strain and the more offensive strain, were all working in there. Maybe even the, he's the guy who killed my dad, after all, argument, was also filtering around. What the government was able to build a consensus around was the, WDM, the WMD issue. That was the one, as Paul Wolfowitz said afterwards, which we could kind of coalesce all the multifarious motivations around as the, as the reason we would put front and center. Great, great. That, I think, gives us a good, uh, a good beginning, a good background to, to share. So now, now comes for the, the harder question for, uh, for all of you, um, which is, uh, and maybe you'll think this is unfair, but, uh, but I hope you'll uh, bear with me anyway. What, what did you think of the decision to invade at the time? Um, and what do you think about it now? And, and to Phil, I want to ask um, uh, more specifically, you know, so that some other um, uh, Dartmouth alums, uh, Nate Fick, for example, many of us uh, know him or have read his book, joined the, the war um, he joined uh, joined the Marines before 9/11, uh, even, and then uh, I have other uh, students who joined um, after 9/11, but before Iraq. But you joined um, the Marines after the invasion of Iraq, right? Or uh, right. So I started the process in 2003. I knew we were going in, um, and I supported the decision at the time. Um, a lot of Americans did. I think now we tend to forget how popular the war was. I think at one point yeah. there was high 70s approval rating. Later it didn't work out so well, and then it was just Bush's fault. Um, but uh, I had the choice to accept my commission in 2005. Um, so did, did, did you think about this? What were you thinking yeah, about the I, war I, at the time? That you know, I, I had a different relationship to it. Um, and I think that my, my family did. My older brother, uh, did his first deployment in 2005 to Iraq. Uh, his, my older brother was also a Marine, and I have a younger brother in the Army now. And it was very funny the, the, the way that sometimes I feel like that there's a political discussion about the war, frequently which focused on whether we should have gone in. But there's a kind of pragmatism to people in the military uh, and also to military families. You know, if you, if you ask my parents at that time what they felt about the war and whether we should have gone in, you, you know, they had their own opinions, you would have gotten a different uh, answer probably from, depending on which one you talked to. But, you know, if you'd asked my father in 2005 what his main concern was, he was furious and upset that Donald Rumsfeld was still the Secretary of Defense um, because it was, it was kind of mind-boggling to him that, that uh, someone who had, you know, in his mind... Uh, had proved himself wildly incompetent and had, had forced out 
or you know, pushed back against everybody who showed any kind of prescience about what Iraq would be, that this person was still running the effort. And for him, that just that made it more likely that his sons were going to be in danger. Um, and so I went in with certainly reservations about um, the leadership. Um, though I was very, you know, I, I wanted to go overseas. I wanted to do my part. You know, whether, whether we should have been there or not, we'd gone in uh, and we'd created a lot of chaos. Um, and I wanted to see what I could do. Uh, so, and I, I think a lot of Marines felt that way. I think that, that now, looking back, you have a lot more soul searching and people not really sure what to think. I was at, a, I was at an event recently and a, a Marine stood up and he said, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran of Iraq and, and if you'd asked me two years ago to, to make a resume of my life, right, not a resume for a job but of just who I am, um, all the biggest bullets would have been that I was a Marine veteran, I led Marines in Iraq, uh, combat veteran, and he said, now I'm looking at Iraq and wondering if I was part of an evil thing and if I get to be proud of it. And if, if, that, if, I, if I can't, then I don't know who I am anymore. Um, and I think in, you know, in different ways, every veteran of Iraq is looking at what's going on um, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of rage and a lot of horror and grief for, for what was lost and also for the suffering of, of the Iraqi people um, and trying to, to make sense of what that means for them and also what that means for them as citizens and their relationship to America. Bill and Steve? Well, I'll, uh, we'll just maybe go down the line here. Uh, I'll say that uh, making decisions about war, even deciding from the sidelines what you think about war, is, uh, is, 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 is a challenging thing. And uh, we would like it if people who made those decisions had a sense of what war is actually like. On the other hand, we don't want them to have a sense of war is actually like because we don't want to have wars. So in the imperfect world that we live in, uh, one advice would be, one piece of advice would be for those who make these decisions to do their level best to get as up close and personal of what the experience of war is like as they can. And I think uh, on that front, I can, for those of us uh, who will not or, or, or have uh, never have this experience, I, I think you can't do much better than reading Phil's book, <laughs> frankly. Um, uh, so this is my chance to plug the book. I'm, I'm, I, ben gave me a copy a few days ago, and I'm almost done because it's, uh, it's, such, an, it's, such, a, it's such an extraordinary piece of work. So did I have that kind of thought in my mind back in 2002? Did I think about it? I, I, I'd like to think I did in a kind of geeky academic way. I mean, I've read a lot of books after I grew up in the post-Vietnam era. I read all of the Vietnam, you know, books. I read the things they carried. I, I read dispatches. I, I watched the movies uh, that try to capture the view. And by the way, some of that is in, I think maybe it's all wars, but some of that is in this, this work of Phil's. And so I thought that war should be the last resort even though we had just had all of these experiences of successful application of power. You can't read books like this, much less actually participate in the events, even if you don't know anybody who's participated in events, and not come to the conclusion that you should treat war as a different kind of policy option, just not one of a, all of the policy tools, but a kind of special one, and one that, as Clausewitz wrote, is really hard to control. And so I, did, I will say for myself, I did have those feelings in my mind back then. However, I did not unambiguously oppose this. I was caught up in the world that thought that they had WMD, that thought it was really serious, that thought we had to do something about it, and that thought that the policies of the 90s were total failures. And I thought that this would work as an example of what I'm afraid to use the jargon, but what they call coercive diplomacy. Namely, if you could credibly threaten Saddam, you could get a deal that would be acceptable to the international community and you could actually resolve this issue. The thing I didn't, that worried me about the status quo in 2002 was this simmering 20, well, it wasn't, it was a 12-year problem that was just sitting there and just never going away. How do we resolve this? The, the best argument for it was we've got all these troops in Saudi, we've got all these troops in the region, we have this footprint because of this problem. If we could solve this problem, we could get out. And so I thought the course of diplomacy idea was 
it was a good one, that we would credibly threaten Saddam with unacceptable consequences if he didn't fess up uh, 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 and, 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 and um, fulfill the obligations uh, that he had undertaken and as part of the peace treaty that, that were involved in those Security Council resolutions. My opposition to the US, form, uh, U.S. policy came about when it seemed like that policy was working. It seemed like we had deployed a credible force in Kuwait. It seemed like we were getting the inspectors back in. And it seemed like at that point, why, what, why did we, I, 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 w I thought that the, the course of diplomacy strategy was working and therefore thought that given the war is really bad, you know, why not wait and until we see if the course of diplomacy thing kinds of work, kind of works. So I'd love to come up before you today and say, oh, I was always a strident opponent of the war, blah, blah, blah. In fact, I was one of these typical geeky academic quasi, you know, positions where I, where I wasn't a full-throated opponent, but then ultimately opposed the rush to war that I seemed to see and train uh, with the Bush administration at the time. I was a strident opponent from the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you, you know, my views uh, at the time were, uh, were shaped by two things. Uh, the one was uh, that uh, I just finished a book with a co-author on Iraq, on Iraqi state and society. Um, in the fall of 2002, I was living in London. Um, and. I had this strange experience of being summoned uh, to 10 Downing Street along with a couple of colleagues to brief Tony Blair on Iraq. And uh, uh, the, the three of us who were there basically said the same thing. Can of worms, do not do this. Don't open that door. Um, you know, 10 years of sanctions uh, had uh, demolished Iraqi civil society and uh, just dismantled and then ground into dust the Iraqi middle class. Uh, there seemed to be nothing from our perspective to work with in a post-conflict scenario for some kind of uh, reconstruction or stabilization of the country. There was no elite that could be depended upon. Um, uh, so anyway, we said, uh, you know, can of worms, and then Blair, um, and I, I assume he wasn't dissembling because the only other person in the room was Jack Straw, who was his foreign secretary. Um, you know, Blair said, well, are you telling me that Iraqis will be better off with Saddam than without Saddam? And, and I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, and replied that, uh, that was just a thought bubble, I mean the word bubble, <laughs> was, um, uh, you know, well, Mr. Prime Minister, some Iraqis will be better off and others will not be. And the ones that will not feel themselves to be better off will resist. Um, and, and the... It, the debate, I'm sorry to say, uh, didn't get very detailed because his response was just, so are you telling me that, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that was, that was the one thing. The other, the, the other thing that shaped my view was um, my having already been uh, in the U.S. government in various places at the State Department, the White House, um, for about 20 years, and uh, in a lot of assignments that involved the coordination of the complex diplomacy that's required to support military operations. And um, <clears throat> I just felt that, on the basis of that experience, that we could not do it, that we couldn't do it. I had no doubt that we could get in and depose you know, Saddam and destroy the Iraqi army, but uh, I didn't believe for a second uh, that we would be able to control the country um, uh, effectively, uh, in part because uh, I didn't think that we had um, uh, the wherewithal, uh, and in part because I didn't think that uh, the American public would support it for as long as it would have to be supported. 200 years, whatever it is. Um, so uh, my skepticism was really, um, uh, was really unconfined. And, uh, you know, lastly, you know, the, 
the U.S. Uh, was, I think, uh, as, as you were saying, was, was going to invade. I don't think, actually, that, that Gore would have done it, but that, I mean, that's highly speculative, and, and it would be an interesting discussion, actually. But um, uh, I think the Bush administration was going to do it uh, one way uh, or another um, in researching you know, something else I was doing on this. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I spoke to somebody who was on the NSC staff uh, at the time and working for Condi Rice, and this was in early 2002. This was around, um, uh, you know, the Lincoln's birthday in uh, 2002. Um, and I've known him for a long time. Uh, you know, we're kind of good pals. And, and he had gone to, um, uh, to Condi Rice one day to say, uh, listen, Condi, I... You know, I can't do my job effectively if I'm not cut in. I need to be cut in. And she says, but you are cut in. There's, there's nothing you're not informed about. You know everything I know. And, and he said, but, you know, Condi, I'm, I, I'm being cut out of the war planning meetings in the office of the vice president. And she said, what? <laughs> Um, so, you know, this was a war that was in train, uh, you know, very early on. Uh, it was unavoidable. Um, there are those, uh, you know, who make the argument that, in a sense, war was, was built into, um, uh, was, was sort of built into this process because um, by the end of the 1990s, smart sanctions had failed. Um, uh, it was the U.S. and the Brits on the Security Council and uh, the French and the Chinese and the Russians arrayed against them. And uh, it looked like there would be only two choices. Uh, the one uh, would be uh, the Russian and French path, which would have seen the, re, uh, the reintegration of the Saddam regime into the international order. Uh, and the other would have been the destruction uh, of the uh, of the Saddam uh, regimes, so there are people who sort of argue that it was sort of you know it was going to go one way or the other, and that it couldn't possibly wind up with the reintegration uh, of the regime. But suffice it to say, the Bush administration was really committed to this and committed to it at the very outset uh, in the first meetings uh, in the Situation Room uh, as the news of 9/11 sunk into senior policymakers. The talk around the Situation Room table was that Iraq was responsible, and that um, perception never really went away. Well, that's a good uh, segue to the the next question that I, I had, and this one I think really is uh, for all of you. If you if you step back and is regardless of what you thought the United States was hoping to achieve in Iraq, whatever of those long lists of goals that we might have had, um, I think you'd find it difficult to argue that on any of those counts our, our intervention there has been a success. Obviously the country is currently in the state of civil war, very serious um, civil war. The country's basically been ethnically cleansed. Um, there are even still today um, over a million refugees, if you count internally uh, displaced uh, people um, in Iraq. Uh, not a functioning democracy by any real uh, sense of the term. Um, I think most people would agree, uh, whatever you thought about Saddam's relationship to terrorism before the war, uh, terrorism is a much greater problem in Iraq today than it was uh, before the war. If you ask Iraqis, as some people have done in polls, uh, a majority of them uh, now say that they were uh, that they're worse off now after the war than they were um, before. Only the Kurds uh, of the different ethnic groups um, say that they're uh, that they're better off. And as this fighting happens closer and closer to them, I wonder um, whether they might even change their mind uh, about it. The majority of Americans, <coughs> by the way, uh, agree now that the the war was a mistake. A vast majority of Americans, in fact, American public opinion shifted on the war, it's hard to remember, um, all the way back in 2005. That's the first time that majorities started to say that the war was a mistake. Uh, but now uh, that's up to uh, close to 70 percent uh, of Americans who believe the war was a mistake. Of course, if you think of the bigger picture regionally, uh, most people would agree Iran has emerged, the winner of the, the Iraq war, strengthened um, as, a, as a result of it. Uh, we could go on and on about the, the costs and, and failures. Uh, but that just raises what I think is the, is the big question, why? Why weren't we more successful in Iraq? Why weren't we able to achieve uh, 
any of these goals? What did we, what did we do wrong? What could we have done uh, better? So start with you, Phil. Oh boy. Uh, what could we have done better? It's gonna take a while, right? <laughs> um, God. You can take this even from your perspective there on the well, ground or, or I'm not gonna, I'm, I'll leave the policy heavy hitters to <laughs> explain some of this, but I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, so I was talking with a, with a journalist who had been embedded in Afghanistan in 2011. And you know, he'd been with troops. Um, it was a pretty serious fight going on in, in Helmand. Um, and I was talking to him, I think, in 2013. And he said, he said, you know, I just caught myself talking about the war as if it wasn't still happening. And I was just over there. And if I'm doing that, what does that, what does that say for the rest of us? And I think that, um, you know, there's, there's such a huge disconnect. I think veterans feel it very keenly. I know I certainly felt it. The, the first time I came back from Iraq, I had two weeks of leave, and I had seen a, I lived near a, a surgical facility. I'd seen a Marine die. I'd, I'd seen a lot of, you know, injured people come in, Iraqi uh, civilians, troops, insurgents, and flew back to New York, and I remember walking down Madison Avenue just feeling like, where am I? What... Um, there's no sense that we're at war. And if you come back, you know, at the end of my tour, I came back to Jacksonville, North Carolina. And in, it was much easier because everybody in Jacksonville is very aware of the fact that we're at war. There are small pockets of the country that are, you know, that are engaged in this. And for the rest of the public, it's an all-volunteer military, um, it might not be the biggest thing on your mind, uh, particularly since the, the recession. So, one of the reasons that that's disturbing is because ultimately, you know, we as citizens are responsible for holding our elected leaders accountable. Um, it's pretty easy to run a war on autopilot or, you know, if, if people aren't really engaged in what the policy is. And I think that frequently the, the political discussions about the war were more about, you know, whichever team you were on than, than really trying to understand what was actually happening and what might be effective. Um, you know, I like to throw more dirt at Donald Rumsfeld, but it's just kind of amazing to me that that, uh, that anyone would ever, would, would still give him credence. Um, so, and and that continues when you, when you get out of the military, because, you know, I, I went and lived in New York and, um, it was very easy to not think about the war, not really want to think about it because it's hard. What do we do? And also, what is my responsibility in terms of this as, as a citizen? What ought I be doing? Um, and yet, you know, people who keep going over and you find out every once in a while that something bad has happened to them. Um, so, I think for me, regardless of what policy proposals um, people are putting forward. It's usually heartening to me when I think that somebody's thinking seriously and deeply about the war, even if I disagree them, d disagree with them. Um, rather, you know, re regardless, almost, re almost, regardless of what that policy is. So. Wow. Well, I, here I got to go for Steve because he's the expert. So you know, uh, but I'd say. He's going to say there's nothing we could have done, I think, but we'll see what he says because he just told us 200 years. So if it's 200 years, you know, we're not going to stay there it's 200 years. Eye. Blink of an eye, yeah, for countries as long, with such long histories as ours. Uh, I would say that um, I'll put forward an argument. I don't, the answer is I think it's just it, it, all these is counterfactual speculation. There are, there are episodes in the book where you see how the military is operating on the ground where, you know, you, you, you step back from that and wonder how the heck we ever thought it was going to work in any sense of kind of making Iraqis like the United States or emulate it or, or anything like that. I mean, just how do you have a rel actually a relatively small military force, given the size of the country, essentially providing sovereign order in the entire country and also fight a counterinsurgency all at the same time and then also have them actually like you, I, you know. 
So, but uh, here's, here's, a, here's, here's a, uh, what I hope is a provocative argument, and probably most people will hate it and disagree with it. That is, the whole problem with this thing was the fact that we were believers in democracy and humanitarian and human rights. A ruthlessly realist United States, a ruthless, ruthless cynical United States, might, first of all, have been less interested in democratizing Iraq, in which case it may have been more willing to settle for a deal with Saddam that didn't involve invading the country. So we had a troop, a very credible force in Kuwait. We had, we had Saddam opening up the country like he'd never opened it up before since the end of the war. We had people telling us, this is awesome. We're getting everything we'd hoped for. Let's just, let's just keep working this. Let's get him. He's on his knees. Why are you screwed up by actually invading? So one way that the thing could have come out a little bit better is not to invade in the first place. If you have to invade and depose the regime, the only way I could possibly see anything remotely like success, and here again, I'm interested to see what Steve says, is if you, you have to hold the existing state as your ally. You have to get rid of its leader, Saddam. But the state, by which I mean the functioning authorities and institutions, which are, by the way, bloody horrible and awful, who actually run the country cannot be destroyed. You, you, there's no other way to maintain any kind of order. So the US would have essentially had to trade one Sunni dictator for another and presided over the creation of another undemocratic, repressive, awful regime that kept order in there, but however had one difference from the previous regime, namely, he was willing to A, credibly ensure that it had no weapons of mass destruction and would never support any terrorist act against the United States, and B, that it wouldn't let the country fall apart. And that kind of deal with the devil, this country does all the time in international politics. But for some reason, we refused to do it then. One of them might be we had the soaring vision of how much power we had. Another might be the Tony Blair case. There was a very strong case on the left in the US and UK and elsewhere supporting this intervention on humanitarian grounds. That's why you had Blair on board. That's why you had a lot of left-wing critics on board. That's why you had a lot of journalists on board. And you can't do it that way and then go and make a deal with the existing regime. Oh, I largely agree. You know, there's not much to, to fault in that analysis. I mean, it, 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 if you want to get down to cases, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, planned and uh, deployed for a war that uh, was not the war that actually happened. So it wasn't going to work out all that well. Um, uh, when you combine that with the fact that the nature of uh, the U.S. assault uh, was such that it decapitated uh, the Iraqi government virtually instantaneously um, and in the process incapacitated it, so that it couldn't provide anything um, uh, in the wake of the attack. Uh, a, a baleful effect that was only reinforced by the policies of the occupying administration, uh, which were to uh, rule out the participation of Ba'athists um, in, the, in the government and also to dismantle the army, um, uh, officers of which uh, are now allied with ISIS. Uh, in a kind of, um, I don't know, strange pathological relationship, but one that's proved militarily very effective, um, uh, at least right now, for the moment. So, um, you know, once the state was, uh, was incapacitated in this way, uh, there, as I mentioned a second ago, you know, there was no civil society left, no middle class. The country had been stripped bare by sanctions um, over a prolonged period of time. And these were extremely comprehensive sanctions, even taking into account the oil for food program, um, um, which enabled Iraq to import some stuff that it otherwise wouldn't have been able to under sanctions uh, during that period. Um, uh, there, was, uh, there was really um, nobody to make that country work, and it only made sense at that point in an extremely chaotic, even anarchic environment uh, for the, the different groups uh, in, uh, uh, in Iraq to seek shelter under, I guess, what, what you know, scholars call security entrepreneurs who operated under the banner of uh, various uh, you know, sectarian identities. And uh, this really got the ball rolling uh, in a very negative way. Um, and then 
you know, in, in terms of the way the occupation was carried out, I mean, this has been pretty uh, closely studied and it's reported on, it's been reported on, um, you know, really rather extensively. Um, uh, you know, really serious uh, mistakes were made. Um, in the first instance, uh, in the form of the uh, U.S. campaign uh, in the West against, um, uh, you know, Sunni bad actors or malefactors or whatever you want to, you, whatever you want to call them, the Army uh, and the Marine Corps carried out that campaign uh, initially, um, and I and I have to say, it's hard to criticize because they. They're your army and the, they're your Marine Corps. They're supposed to do something, which is suppress um, uh, a revolt, and they're going to do it uh, as uh, effectively and as systematically as they can possibly do it. Um, but the approach that they took didn't conform, uh, as we later learned, to um, uh, you know the, the the finer points of counterinsurgency doctrine, which we learn and then forget and learn and then forget and learn and then forget, um, uh, uh, you know, for generations and have been doing that um, in a kind of cyclical way since uh, the campaign in the Philippines in the turn of the uh, 20th century. So um, you had, uh, you know, a military campaign that worsened an insurgency and then um, you had uh, a counterinsurgency, once a new counterinsurgency in place, once the Secretary of Defense had been eliminated, uh, there was a, um, a total command change in Baghdad, and you had a desperate president, you had a different strategy. But that strategy um, uh, was one that uh, any British colonial administrator could have told you was a prescription for trouble because it involved arming the tribes against the state. This is something you don't do. Bad idea. But anyway, uh, the US did it, and now, of course, we're seeing what happens uh, once you've done that. Uh, if you don't have the 200-year occupation um, uh, in place to deal with the uh, implications. All right, so I just want uh, to do one last set of questions to our panel before I turn it over to you. I think it would be wrong not to, to at least end this portion with, with this question. And so, you know, I've asked why we, why we didn't succeed and how we got in, but, but now we are where we are, right? Uh, Colin Powell famously said uh, the Pottery Barn rule applies, so, so we broke it, and that means we, we bought it. To some extent, um, this is our problem now, whether we, whether we like it or not. Um, and so now uh, I want to maybe reverse the order and, and start with uh, uh, Bill and Steve and ask you guys, so what are the United States' interests in, in Iraq today, despite our Monday attempts at Monday morning quarterbacking, what we might have done differently? Now, where we stand, we, we still are connected um, uh, with Iraq. Uh, you know, do we need to be at all? What are our reasons for a continuing relationship um, with Iraq? What, what do we just have to live with uh, in terms of the, um, that relationship and, and what parts of it uh, can we change? Do we have any tools to make any kind of positive difference or at least what do you think is the, the least worst um, situation uh, with Iraq? And then uh, for Phil, um, I, want, I wanted to ask you um, to again step back and think broadly after 20 years of war, much of the war justified uh, at least in part and publicly and, and my guess is for people like you, uh, justified by an desi honest desire to make things better uh, for the Iraqi people. And after literally millions of Iraqis who threw their lot in um, with us, hoping for the same things that we were hoping for uh, in Iraq, but, but never having received it, some, of our, some people having collaborated with us and paid the, the greatest price for that, what do, what do we owe? Um, to Iraq, put aside maybe our, our national interests in the sense of, you know, terrorism or stability in oil prices or the geopolitics. What do we owe to the to the people of Iraq? For people like you who 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 fought for it and saw people die uh, to make something happen in Iraq, what what do we owe them uh, now? So we'll start with um, Bill and Steve, and then go to Phil. <laughs> 
<laughs> you might answer it. That might, that might handle the whole problem. <laughs> I'm just going to um, embroider. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think that's, a, that's, that's the toughest question for the, pan, for the, for the day. Uh, all, all of what I think we've been asked right now is, is, the, hard, is the hard stuff. And um, it's easy to look back. And it, 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 when you're actually a policymaker, you have to make decisions that, about the future, not about the past. Uh, I would say that um, the first you have to op think, th think first about the principles involved. And one principle is you can only do a policy for which you have the capability. I know that sounds dumb, but don't set yourself a policy that you actually don't have the capability to implement. And uh, Ben uh, already s said some things about the U.S. Uh, public opinion. We also know some things uh, that is to say it's, it, U.S. public opinion is in a setting where there is no support for a large-scale U.S. ground deployment in the Middle East unless there's a direct palpable threat to the U.S. homeland that is not some conjectural threat. I don't see it happening. So that means any policy the U.S. does has to be premised on the policy that, uh, the, on the reality that we're not going to have a large ground presence, and that's, in fact, how the administration is proceeding. We have uh, a uh, very strained budget situation in this country and will have going forward. We have very, very limited options. Therefore, you can't set yourself a goal that you can't have. The, you're not doing Iraqi people any favor if you set a goal and make a promise that you don't have the capability to uh, implement. Therefore, it seems to me you have to have minimal goals, and those goals have to be defensive goals, and they have to be preventing a situation in which developments within the territory of the Islamic Republic of Iraq become dangerous, damaging to the homeland security of the United States of America. Therefore, what the United States is concerned about is not necessarily any instability in Iraq, not necessarily um, any kind of uh, uh, violent activity on the, within the borders of Iraq, but it has to be concerned with violent activity that could have as its outcome to attacks against the United States. And it seems to me that's kind of where the policy is going right now in terms of how they're thinking about ISIS. There may be, there may be loftier goals, uh, uh, but those have to be the minimalist goals. And I think the leverage the United States has for that is not insubstantial, although it's not the way it used to be, but the United States still has considerable amount of leverage uh, at least in the formal sense, and degree that the Iraqi government in Baghdad, for better or for worse, is highly dependent upon its relationship with the United States. So there at the margins, there are things the United States can try to do to limit that. But I would say negative goals and limited goals and modest goals. I agree. Uh, you know, uh, you have to avoid a gap between your resources and your objectives. Uh, you also have to think carefully about what your interests are because that's going to regulate everything, uh, you know, all these other, you know, calculations. And I'd say the U.S. has a, uh, a discernible, if limited, interest in Iraq, uh, which calls for a discernible but limited effort, which also happens to jibe with our capacities right now. Um, uh, the use of air power against ISIS makes a lot of sense, although... <laughs> You know, it's like uh, the use of air power uh, in a situation like this is like romance in the summer of love, gratification without commitment. Perfect. Um, so, you know, we'll do a little of that, uh, and we'll try and work with the Iraqi army as much as uh, we can, because it is, I think, understood as a matter of military logic that um, uh, you can't really defeat an enemy only from the air. You have to really chip away at him on the ground, too. Uh, and that requires ground forces, but those won't come from, from the United States. Uh, those will have to be Iraqi or maybe the Peshmerga. You know, uh, the Kurdish forces will, I don't know, get their pants up. It's possible. Um, or at least it's not inconceivable. So I think what you're going to see is more of what you already are seeing. I mean, I think the real um, uh, dilemma for the administration right now is not what it does in Iraq. I think even at the very moment that um, uh, President Obama was saying, for whatever reason, um, uh, at that press gaggle that, you know, he, we didn't yet have a strategy. At that point, we were already several weeks into a strategy in Iraq that was already being implemented. Um, and implemented fairly uh, systematically. But the, the dilemmas will happen in, uh, in Syria. That's where they'll arise because um, another, you know, 
attribute of uh, you know, military logic in a situation like this is to deprive an insurgency of cross-border safe haven, cross-border sanctuary, because they're really hard to beat. If you, know, you take a whack at them and then they go across the border and they've got some place safe where they can kind of hang out, um, uh, lick their wounds, uh, reconsolidate, and then come back, come back at you, you want to be able to go across the border to hit them, and that was the idea uh, behind um, uh, the strikes in Syria initially. But at this point, um, uh, because of ISIS's burgeoning activity and the fact that um, uh, the fact that a Brit in Syria killed an American, <laughs> where you know we're now you know uh, in, we're now carrying out airstrikes uh, deep into Raqqa, which is the middle of Syria and north in Idlib by the uh, by the Turkish border. Um, uh, strikes are in the vicinity of Aleppo, which is sort of the grand big city of of um, uh, you know western central. Uh, Syria, um, uh, the administration is perilously close to actually involving itself as a combatant in the Syrian civil war, which is something that um, the administration has sought to avoid, because if you think that you just have a limited interest in Iraq, you don't have an instrument sensitive, sensitive enough to measure how small your interest is in Syria, and, or at least in the outcome of that civil war. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that with all those uh, U.S. airplanes, you know, flying around, plinking away at, at, at you know, ISIS jeeps and motorcycles or whatever they're shooting um, uh, over there, at some point in um, uh, a moderate opposition unit under attack by the regime is going to ring up and say, hey, you were just protecting me five minutes ago against an ISIS attack. How about coming to my rescue against this regime force? Um, that will be a very challenging moment, you know, for the administration. Yeah. Um, visas for former translators would be nice. Um, uh, I think we left a lot of people out to dry. Um, I remember, well, there's, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I, I remember when the night that uh, Obama announced that uh, Osama bin Laden had been killed, um, about two hours before I'd gotten a call from uh, one of my Marines uh, who I'd served with, a really great guy uh, who'd been uh, in an IED strike. <clears throat> and he let me know that the you know, temporary <laughs> blindness uh, that he'd suffered was actually permanent. And, you know, then two hours later, I'm, you know, watching the students chanting USA and, on television. Um, I think that the, the issue of that gratification without commitment is really serious. I think that, I already mentioned how I think that with the all-volunteer military, I think that, um, that that's an issue. But with, you know, drone strikes and the kill capture missions, the special forces, you know, now you're not talking about 1% of America that's engaged in the wars, you're talking about a fraction of that, um, and a fraction of that where everything is very classified. Um, and it's very easy to say that you've got to win. I remember a situation that a buddy of mine had, you're talking about that, you know, devil's bargain. And uh, in his area in Iraq, they'd made a, a sort of, you know, devil's bargain and, uh, the SEALs came in, they said, all right, we want to take out this one guy. You know, we hear he's a, kind of a local power player in your neighborhood, uh, but, uh, you know, we've got intel that, you know, a while back he was a, you know, prince of Al-Qaeda or whatever. And they said, whoa, 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 no, he's not, he's not a power player. He's the power player. He's the, you know, linchpin of, of what we've got going right now. And they're like, okay, well, we, you know, we supersede you. And they took him out. And then everything kind of unraveled. And a lot of the folks that I know who did stuff in kill capture missions, a lot of them feel very good about what they did, you know. We went in, we took out a guy, he had a torture house in his basement, like he was definitely a bad guy, and you know, we got him off the battlefield. And I did that every night for my deployment and then came home and I felt great about it. Um, guys who did counterinsurgency, they're making a lot of those devil's bargains 
it's very difficult to see long term whether you know the gains that you're making are sustainable. Uh, you have to ask yourself a lot of very hard questions. Um, and I think that there's a danger as we, you know, when we want to use military force, particularly the, you know, gratification without commitment, um, that it'll be easy for us to say, well, you know, we got bad guys. We always like to get bad guys. But is this, is this a tactic in service of a strategy that's going to affect, you know, long-term positive outcomes? Or is it just a tactic that we really like using? And that's really cool because special forces are cool and, and all those other things. So I think it requires a lot of thought. All right, well, you've given us lots to, to think about, and I hope uh, that's enough to get the, the discussion going. I think it's more, more than enough, obviously. And so now I want to make sure uh, you all have a chance to, to ask questions. So if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll recognize you. Um, he's in class today, uh, Jeff Friedman's Civil War Insurgency and International Response Course. And um, a classmate of mine said that in his opinion, he thought that the U.S. population would only support a massive troops on the ground effort if ISIS were to attack the U.S. directly. And I kind of countered that and said, we're in a phase of downsizing because that's just what needs to happen right now. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on if there were a massive, significant, not just like a little car bomb, I'm talking something, a very public place where a lot of people get hurt, um, that kind of thing hypothetically were to happen. Do you, one, think that the US would respond with a massive troops on the ground effort? And two, do you think the American people would actually be in favor of that effort? <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I don't know, I think we're pretty war weary. I guess it depends on, on what kind of attack it is, right? I mean, you know, never underestimate the ability of people to get overexcited about sort of threats. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't I, I think, I don't, I think that there's so much skepticism about what that kind of effort could even do that I'm, I'm doubtful, but I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on how, if you, how serious a threat you're talking about. I think that uh, when you ask that question, what would the American people support, we always should keep in mind what Phil just said a few minutes ago about the uh, all-voluntary military. It's not only an all-voluntary military, but as Phil mentioned, there's a concentrated areas where the military presence is much greater, the military traditions are much greater, the military's role in the community is much greater, and there's other large swaths of the country where you hardly notice it. There are places in the country where, by the way, seeing military uniforms, seeing convoys, and in, 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 in uh, all drab and camo is all very common. There are other parts where you almost never see a military vehicle on the highway. So that means that the, 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 the American people in the majority will have views that may be uninformed by any interaction with or much interaction with people who have actually served in the military. Um, so that's that cost, benefit, that sort of cost sharing problem that is in, inherent in a, in a voluntary military. With that as a background, I would say that my guess, and I would defer to students of American politics, really, experts on American public opinion, but my guess is that it would yet again galvanize. I mean, I think there's two ways, and there's several things that can happen, but based on the 9-11 experience, the American public's tolerance for uh, inflicting uh, really wreaking really heavy death and devastation, devastation on other societies is pretty high. In other words, this country is willing to do pretty nasty things to other countries. So I think the first thing is, the, in response to your question, is if it's a question of whacking them, even with a lot of civilian casualties, I think there'd be zero domestic resistance to that after an event like that. If it had to do with a high-cost U.S. 
engagements in terms of U.S. soldiers and taxes and stuff, we just don't know. I think the likelihood is the tolerance of that would be pretty high. But I'll tell you another thing the experience of 9-11 teaches, and that is that the tolerance of Americans for civil liberties infringements after such events is very, very high. And it's now come down. We had our whole response to Snowden. We're all outraged, blah, blah, blah. But after another attack like that, particularly if an attack like that was alleged to have happened because we let our guard down, because we got too concerned about Snowden-type revelations, you'd see a massive groundswell in this country in favor of whatever, this, whatever you guys want to do, whatever the government wants to do, we're for it. Smack any kind of civil rights. I mean, there'd be huge support for that. So in some sense, some people pause it. I don't know how serious it is. A trade-off between acting abroad and reducing civil liberties here to prevent future such attacks. And I don't exactly know how that trade-off would be would be resolved, but I'm sure that the, 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 the tolerance, the willingness to support pretty, pretty hefty military engagements and infringements on civil liberties would go up with a, in, the, in the wake of a, especially if you're a dramatic attack uh, uh, on, on U.S. civilians. Um, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on the motivating quality of fear. Um, We've seen a rise of fear on the part of the American public with the Ebola epidemic, and that kind of thing can be um, can be manufactured. So actually, what I'm thinking of is the recent attack in Canada by a lone gunman. But that kind of lone gunman thing was made to happen in a variety of places. You'd certainly see an increase in the fear on the part of the American people. How, what, how would that? Uh, well, you, there's, uh, there are, there's already intriguing um, uh, survey data, you know, on this from back-to-back, -back, well, separated by a week, NBC and ABC News polls. And uh, the more recent, uh, the ABC poll, uh, um, uh, showed a, a large plurality, you know, in the mid-40s of ground troops, use of ground troops uh, to deal with ISIS. Now, when you disaggregate uh, the respondents, um, you know, the, the, that plurality was, the plurality within that plurality was Republican and not Democrat, but, you know, the, but they're Americans, you know. They're, so, um, uh, you know, I think that there's some, uh, you know, basis to think that, that, that uh, you know, the fear thing is working. Now, if you, if you look carefully at all the, the public statements that were made, um, and not just by Fox News, but somewhat inexplicable statements about ISIS that came out of the administration, not out of the counterterrorism community, which has been notably low key uh, on the ISIS threat, but the Secretary of Defense and, and others who've come out and said they've never seen anything like ISIS before, you know, this is an existential threat, that kind of thing. Um, you know, when you appear to be getting, um, I mean, from a public opinion perspective, uh, when you appear to be getting um, the, uh, a consensus of elites around a certain proposition, in this case, ISIS is going to come to your house tonight and eat your children, um, then, uh, you know, you're going to think that that's actually going to happen. Uh, and, and you're going to consider some pretty extreme responses. I mean, it's a tricky thing for the administration, presumably, because, um, you know, there are the, 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 the economic factors that I think Ben pointed out earlier. Um, uh, you know, the, the military is in a big hole uh, right now. And looking into the out years, because of a host of, of, of factors, mostly relating to personnel and, and health uh, care, um, expenses that are now built into the system owing to the war in Iraq, we're looking at a very big cost into the out years. So, you know, the military is very concerned now about additional deployments. And then if you look globally, again, if, if you're the administration, you're going to think, well, you know, we've got the military balance in Asia shifting in favor of an aggressive China, where you have the PLA now talking openly about taking Taiwan, now's the time. Um, and, uh, you know, NATO implicated uh, in this uh, struggle in Europe involving Putin and Ukraine and, and, and all that, you are going to think, do I want to get involved in another land war in the Middle East right now, you know, given all these, all these factors? Now, 
administrations can be pushed in untoward directions because of the pressure of public opinion, but they can also have a hand in shaping public opinion. So it would be interesting to see in the event how, um, how this administration or a succeeding administration would actually handle crisis of that kind. Professor Wolfworth uh, discussed a little bit of coercive diplomacy in relation to the uh, WMDs in Iraq. Um, and looking at Iraq, maybe even looking at Syria, it looks like the, the U.S.'s record of coercive diplomacy wasn't very successful. Um, so going a little bit off topic, but looking at Iran right now in the Middle East, what makes Iran different than precedents we've seen in the Middle East in terms of coercive diplomacy as a means to prevent troops on the ground and, and military action? Well, the, uh, I, I, yeah, there's a little, you know, it's a, if we consider sanctions to be part of coercive diplomacy, then the main lever on Iran right now is sanctions. And, uh, you know, uh, there is a consensus among at least the people I read who purport to be experts that they even they are not sufficient to get Iran to accept the deal that is as any this all that close to what we would like. So my expectation is that with the current degree of pressure on Iran, and if a deal is to be made and people are talking about it, it will, will not, be, not be one that makes us particularly happy and certainly not one that makes Israel particularly happy. So it's showing you the limits of this kind of, this kind of pressure. Uh, I know that in the past, uh, Vice President Biden proposed like sort of like a federalism plan in Iraq, to, like split it into three parts, kind of, and it got like pretty widely panned. But I'd be interested to know, like, for the future, whether that's something you think could work, or whether that'd be something that's like overreaching our commitment, as, as you talked about earlier. Yeah, it's right out of the bell of Gallicum. Um, uh, yeah, uh, look. You got to let what happens naturally happen naturally. Um, there's going to be a large swath of Iraq uh, that will be outside of the control of Baghdad, um, you know, for the foreseeable future because there isn't any um, military capacity to change that. Um, and there's probably no political capacity to induce the population in that area of Iraq um, uh, to cooperate uh, with the government. And in fact, a, a plan that had been advanced just recently for a National Guard up there. Anyway, I don't want to get that into the weeds, but it's, that's not really likely to happen anytime soon. The Kurdish regional government, uh, that area of Iraq is, uh, is, I think, scarcely likely to be reintegrated. Uh, into Iraq, at least in the foreseeable future, and in fact, uh, it's quite possible it will go in the other direction um, and distance itself even further, perhaps in a de jure or juridical way from the government uh, in Baghdad. Um, and the government in Baghdad will, uh, you know, rule or govern uh, to the extent that it's capable of, of governing over a kind of a rump area of Iraq that's largely um, Shiites since in 2007, most of the Sunnis, particularly in Baghdad, in the greater Baghdad area, were um, ethnically cleansed. It's only about 10% of the population of Baghdad now and is, is, uh, is Sunni. So, um, you know, I think uh, you'll just see this sort of thing evolve naturally without the vice president's active involvement. <laughs> Phil, you, you, you traveled around a lot, so probably had interactions with members of all the different main ethnic groups in, in Iraq that you were there. And do you have some sense about the plausibility of some multi-ethnic democracy? I mean, can, can they work these differences out in some, just from having actually, you know, spoken with these people from these different groups, what was your impression then or now? Um. Well, I mean, I, I suspect that what you said is, is, is quite right. Um, I mostly interacted with Sunnis. Um, if, I was a, if I was a Sunni living in, in Ambar province, I'm not sure why I would um, 
be very motivated to support the central government. Um, and, you know, I think the Kurds have wanted independence for a while. And, uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think it's, it's uh, <clears throat> the conditions don't, don't, don't seem to, that they'll move in that direction. I think, you know, th there was a moment where maybe uh, the Sunni tribes were, were more willing to talk about integration with the, with the government. And I think that uh, uh, certainly with everything that's happened, particularly past 2010, there are a lot of reasons uh, for them not to. Yes, sir. Just going, uh, carrying that, uh, that issue uh, further uh, down the line, to what extent should uh, American efforts, diplomatic and other, uh, be, be focused on uh, you know, making a, uh, a final you know, separation? Uh, certainly Syria has been, uh, uh, there's been a lot of serious talk about you know, Syria being divided into the Alawite and the uh, uh, Sunni and, uh, and Kurdish areas, uh, and, uh, how, about, how about Iraq? As, as an active uh, um, uh, a, a point of view, a, an active uh, position for, for America to pursue. I think it's also a question of, I mean, what influence do we have, right? Um, I, I, there was a Sunni politician who was talking to a US journalist and said, you've, you've baked Iraq like a cake and given it to Iran to eat. Um, yeah, um, I, I certainly think going forward we should have a, a sense of the limitations of our power. Could, do you mind if I, can I ask yep. Phil a question? Yep. So Phil, I was interested, we're, we're at this panel and we're kind of talking about the U.S. kind of getting, <laughs> pulling back in Iraq, and we also, there's that very, there's been that very powerful evidence from Ben Valentino about how the American people think of it as a mistake and a failure, and we haven't, Given you a chance to say, kind of, at the affect level in your, in your heart, you know how that makes you feel and how that makes your friends who are also vets feel. Um, I mean, I mean awful. Things that were that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, sure, <laughs> yeah, clearly. awful. But you noticed that there, you mentioned there were some units, some missions that somehow you can look back on and say, you know, we did, we did proud of what we did, even if the, if the global thing didn't work out. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, I think that's a, that's a question everybody has to grapple with, right? Um, and, I already, and I already mentioned a little that I think it often makes a big difference in terms of what type of job you did and even when you were there, right? You know, there, there are some vets who are very invested in this narrative of like, well, we won in 2007, and then somehow it got screwed up, right? Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of what General Dempsey tried to push when he said, you know, you did a great job, and, and the Iraqi people screwed it up. Uh, I forget exactly what he said, but that was the gist of it, and it's kind of nonsense. Um, I think, you know, I already mentioned, you know, the Marine wondering whether he should be ashamed of his service. I don't feel that. I'm proud of what I did. Um, uh, though, you know, the U.S. effort failed. I think that, that there were Marines trying very hard to, you know, reduce the violence and, and make a better outcome in that. Um, and I think that is worthy of, you know, there's this weird way in which, how do you grapple with your service in, in, in response to a war, you know? If, if you were in World War II and you, I don't know, bomb civilians in Dresden, you come back and you're part of the greatest generation. We won! <laughs> Um, if you did a great job in Iraq and, you know, were really thoughtful, serious, courageous, and humane uh, combat leader, um, well, you were, you were part of a disastrous mistake and you should feel a little bit ashamed of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that every vet needs to, needs to, to wonder about, you know. But in a, in a way, it's, it's made a lot of the veterans I know, I think, much better citizens. I feel like it's made me a better citizen, much more skeptical. Um, you know, I think there, there certainly are things that we can achieve with, with military force, and, and, and yet um, it has very much impressed upon me the importance of, of, of our duties as citizens, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it's, 
I feel absolute grief and rage when I look at what's happening in Iraq, and I think a lot of people do. It's, it's, it's awful. Um, Bill, do you think the way that the American public talks about this is Yep. Um, I was shocked that two or three of my high school friends ended up enlisting mm -hmm. in the military. So that's just not what's done. Right. And um, I find it interesting that, especially on the West Coast, it seems that veterans are a harder time leaving because the idea of military service is just a little bit beyond the pale. Um, so I'm just interested in your thoughts on um, the dialogue around the war and how that affects um, veterans' relations, relations to civil society. It, it, it definitely does, um, and it definitely matters where you're coming back to. Um, you know, one of my Marines went to college, and he was the only student veteran that he knew. Uh, I felt really isolated, really alone. He said, I wish I could have just been a veteran, uh, just a student, not a student veteran. Um, I think it's, it's, it's much different if there are, there are more veterans, um, if people are a little bit more informed. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you're talking about the different pockets of the, com uh, of the country. I was in Manhattan, Kansas recently, the Little Apple, um, <laughs> where you'll see, you know, guys from Fort Riley in, in their BCUs, like, getting coffee. It's not a big, particularly big deal. Um, and in Manhattan, the Big Apple, uh, you know, every once in a while somebody tells me I'm the first Iraq or Afghanistan veteran that they've met, uh, which is amazing, right, after all these years of war. So... Uh, that can make a difference. There are also a lot of weird narratives about veterans. Uh, certainly, it's far, far better than it was after the Vietnam War. Uh, and I think that uh, we're doing a better job of trying to separate out the notion of service from uh, our feelings about the war, but it's kind of inevitable that that sinks in. There are weird narratives about PTSD that, that is a serious thing that's worth talking about, but I think frequently the way that it, it gets talked about in, in, in the culture is a little strange. Uh, I've been told that I must have PTSD many times. I, I don't. Um, uh, you know, one guy in a bar told me that all Iraq vets are gonna snap after 10 years, and uh, you've been back three, so you got seven left. Um, <laughs> so. Nice guy. I know. He meant it, he was very well-meaning, you know, he just wanted me to know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> better make these next seven years good. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's, especially if you don't know veterans, um, you know, people are sometimes very surprised to find out, like one of my friends protested the Iraq war and joined the military. It's kind of mind boggling. Um, to them, but that veterans are a diverse, complicated group uh, like any other and um, yeah. So, I mean, part of why I wrote the book was uh, to have a, it's kind of my offering to the conversation about the wars and what, what military service might mean, right? And, and um, hopefully to try and give a more complex portrayal than, than you sometimes get. You also get, I mean, people were talking about fear mongering after the Fort Hood shooting. There was just the most irresponsible coverage. Oh, it must have been a PTSD shooting. Um, Huffington Post had put out like the deadly aftermath of war and uh, had all this map of like homicides committed by veterans. And McClatchy had like a, a, a zip code lookup to find out if there were veterans in your area. And like a sex offender database, you know? And it's like, Jesus. Um, for the record, veterans are underrepresented in the nation's jails relative to other um, segments of the population. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot, a lot more to, to be done in terms of the conversation. Uh, but I also think that now you've got a lot more veterans who are really engaging uh, with the public, and I think it's a real asset. Uh, and not just in terms of talking about the, the war, I think some of the best coverage about Ferguson, for example, where veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan who are now in the media who are just going like, yeah, that, that's not how you use that stuff, yeah. right? Um, we didn't adopt that aggressive a posture in Afghanistan. Um, and your IR patch is utterly useless. This is not, like, this is not serious. This is you playing with toys, and, and that's a problem. Um, and there was a lot of really sort of thoughtful commentary, both about, like, uh, 
the real risks that police officers feel, and you know, crowd control is really hard and scary, and, but also um, very informed commentary about you know, what is a serious effort and what's not. So uh, by my watch, we're just uh, about out of time. And I just want to end with uh, an observation, maybe it's an exhortation, uh, before I thank the panel. Uh, and that is, you know, I often say, and I think most of you will agree, one of the jobs of a university or college like this one is to train good citizens, uh, especially an elite institution like Dartmouth. Um, we expect you when you graduate to, to go out and not just have an opinion uh, for yourself, but to be opinion leaders. And uh, our colleges and universities in this country uh, do a good job, I think, training citizens to make decisions about some of the most important questions facing the nation. But, but there is one area where I think we don't do a good enough job uh, training our citizens, and, and that's the kind of subject that we're talking about today, the questions of, of war and peace. Um, and in an era when, uh, as we has come up multiple times here on this panel, most civilians won't have any uh, direct interaction with the military, they won't serve, um, but they will be asked, either by a pollster or by uh, at the ballot box when they choose to vote for one candidate or another, to have a judgment about whether we should have intervened in Iraq in the first place and maybe whether we ought to intervene again um, should something uh, terrible happen. Uh, so, uh, given that that's the case, and given that I think you happen to be at an institution uh, where uh, the opportunities for learning about these subjects are, are better than, uh, than most, and I hope this panel is an example of that, I just, as a, as a parting word to the students in this room, and maybe even to some of the people who look like they might be a little older uh, than our average students, I'd encourage you to continue to try to pay attention to these issues and make it your business uh, to be educated so that when these questions of great national importance come before us again, as they almost certainly will, unfortunately they almost certainly will, with Iraq, with the question that we spent our time on today, that you'll feel you uh, have the, the resources and information you need to make an informed opinion, which is your job as a citizen. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank our panel uh, for what I thought was a really excellent discussion. I hope you all learned as much from it uh, as I did, because I learned a lot, so thanks. Thank you.